Good afternoon. Pardon me. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Osborne, and I am at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. And welcome to today's Early Childhood Scholars uh, Network series where we are bringing together the um, 14 institutions of the University of Texas system to highlight the great work that's being done in early childhood. Um, one of our other institutions was scheduled to go today, but um, due to um, some changes, they had to cancel. And so I'm going to be presenting the work that I have been doing with my research team at the Prenatal to Three Policy Impact Center where we'll be talking about how our state can really build a system of care to support infants and toddlers and their parents. And so uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. And I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. Um, so I wanted to begin by just discussing what really motivates the work that we're doing and, and why we have been focused on the prenatal to three developmental period. The research is abundantly clear that this is a really sensitive period of development. It's the most rapid period of brain's development, and it really sets the stage for all subsequent health and well-being. And the research says that if children are born and raised into nurturing, stable, warm, stimulating environments with limited exposure to adversity, that that can set them on a trajectory of lifelong health and well being. But by contrast, that if children are born into situations in which they're experiencing trauma, either through neglect or extreme poverty or other sorts of exposures to adversity, that are chronic, that this can have neurological and biological and social damage to the developing brain, the developing body, the developing child. And those consequences can be lifelong as well. And unfortunately, there are millions of children who do not have those environments that they deserve from the start that are rich and nurturing in um, resources and love. And that disproportionately it's children of color or children from lower socioeconomic statuses that are exposed to early adversity. And so what we wanted to do was to understand what we could do to help create the conditions in which children thrive. And the research is also clear that state policy choices can um, be put in place to really empower parents to make sure that they have the resources and skills to care for their children in the way that they aspire to and that their children deserve. And that state policy choices can um, help to really provide uh, the resources and create those conditions in which children can thrive from the start. We also know from the evidence that we can't just help the children in isolation that we have to care for the caregivers in order for them to care for the children. So both the parents and child care providers, child welfare workers, all the folks who are serving our infants and toddlers, that they need the support and resources and skills in order to provide those in early um, envir rich environments that set kids off uh, to, on a healthy trajectory. The research is also clear that there is no magic bullet. There's not one policy or program that can do it all. And that we really do need to create this system of care for children and their parents that has broad-based economic and family supports and more targeted interventions that really identify specifically what children need and make sure that they can access those services. But currently, Across this country, children are exposed to a patchwork of benefits and services based on the, uh, their state's policy choices. And so we wanted to learn more about how states can better help to create those conditions that children thrive in. So we first built on that science of the developing child and identified these eight prenatal to three policy goals that again, create those conditions in which 
parents are empowered and children get off to a healthy start and thrive. And so these include making sure that families have access to the services that they're eligible for, that families can balance both work and caring for their children, that families have economic stability, food security, housing stability, that children are born healthy to healthy parents, and that parents have the skills and understanding of children's development that they need in order to provide those nurturing environments for children. And when children are not with their parents, that they're also in nurturing environments in childcare or any other caregiving situation. And finally, that we make sure that we can identify children's, any developmental delays that children might be experiencing as early as possible and get them into the services that they need in order to get them onto a healthy track. So these are goals that are derived right from the science of developing child. And what we did was to look across the country to say, how are our children doing? How are states meeting these goals uh, today? And we identified a handful of uh, data points, outcomes, indicators for, for each of these policy goals um, that are show up again and again in our studies about you know, the things that we know can be impacted by policy. And um, then we looked at national level data to see what the variation is across the country. And it is vast, <laughs> depending on the outcome measure. Um, you, know, you can just look in the first uh, uh, goal here of access needed services that it ranges from you know, fewer than 4% of low income women who don't have health insurance in the state that is doing the best by families to uh, nearly half of low income women who are uninsured in the state that's doing the worst by families. And unfortunately that's where Texas stands um, right now. It's also important though, to pay attention to what the, this range looks like, that this is really just the range of where states are and not necessarily where anyone needs to be. So if you look at developmental screening, we know that these are a crucial part of children's healthy development so that we can identify any delays and get them to the services that they need right away. And in the state that's doing best by families, still 40% of children under age three are not getting screened in these earliest years. So um, these are not targets, these are demonstration of, of how our children are faring, but you can see there's a wide range. It also helps states to identify where their priorities may need to be, that where they are really far to the left here might be the places that our state would need to focus on most. And um, in Texas, something that really has to do with these nurturing behaviors that our families um, are reporting that they're not reading with their children daily, they're not engaging in those nurturing behaviors of playing games and singing songs and, you know, peekaboo and all those sorts of things that we know is really crucial for early brain development. And um, so there are, you know, th th this um, graphic just gives us a peek inside what some of the needs of our families are. So in response to that, we wanted to identify what the most effective investments are that states could make that help to create those conditions. And so again, we started with the science of the developing child. And the whole reason that we're doing this is because we want to create greater equity and opportunities for children that all children deserve to get off to a healthy start and thrive. And the disparities are so great right now based on race, ethnicity, based on socioeconomic status, based on where children live. And so this, our, our commitment throughout this process has been to reduce disparities. And as academics, we're guided by the most rigorous evidence that's available. Um, so we turn to all thousands of peer-reviewed articles that are the most you know, rigorous, found the most rigorous studies that have been conducted to date um, and identified five policies and six strategies that really do make a causal impact on those outcomes that I was showing you earlier. We also re recognize that there are limits to the evidence base. Not everything has been studied. Some things have been studied, but not as rigorously as we would like for them to be. 
there are things that are probably working that are not on our list, and we are committed to trying to build that evidence base and to figure out how states can implement these policies in a more equitable way. In addition to identifying what the most effective policies are, our state policy roadmap also tracks states' progress toward enacting those policies and implementing those policies. We know that policy is a long game and doesn't always just happen overnight, but we want to see kind of the progress that states are making over time and the variation across states and how they're implementing these policies. And because at the end of the day, we're doing this so that we can see improvements in children's well-being and reduction in disparities and opportunities and outcomes that we are tracking and monitoring um, these outcomes over time. So I invite you, if you haven't had an opportunity to visit pn3policy.org, that's where um, you can find our roadmap in addition to a clearinghouse that shows you all of the dozens of policies that we have reviewed to date. And with the roadmap, there is both a um, US version that can show you kind of how all states are doing it in a glance. You can also dig in deep to one of the policies that you find um, most interesting or that you'd like to know more about. So for each of the five effective policies and six effective strategies, there's a profile that provides lots of information. And then you can also review um, whichever state that you're interested in. Most of you probably will be looking at Texas um, and get all of the details and specific information for each of the policies and strategies um, for, for your state. And so I wanna um, kind of show you a little bit more about what's in this roadmap and what we have identified as these effective policies and strategies. So this is our framework for really thinking about how those um, prenatal to three policy goals that are driven by the science align with our effective policies that we identified looking into the most rigorous research that exists to date. And so each column is the circles is a goal and those colored dots illustrate the impact that each of those policy has on and which goals it, 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 they do impact. That way, for if a state is um, wanting to focus on a specific goal, for instance, improving birth outcomes, then they're able to um, turn to those policies that actually have been demonstrated to have an impact on that goal. And you can see from these five effective policies that they're broad economic and family supports. It's expanding Medicaid so that families have access to health insurance, and in particular, that women of childbearing age have access to health care before they become pregnant, that they are able to seek prenatal care early in their pregnancy, and that they're able to maintain access to health care after giving birth. Um, we also identified reducing administrative burden policies. We focused on SNAP, which is the most effective nutrition program in our country, but we are really um, concerned with number of folks who are eligible to receive benefits who don't because of various administrative burden uh, policies that make it harder to re-enroll or to um, access the benefits that you are eligible for. We also identified a pay family leave policy that's at least six weeks in length. That's not the goal, that's the floor. Um, all the research that's been done on paid family leave most of it has been done in California, which was six weeks. And so that's really a minimum that's needed in order to see the impacts that we um, find in the literature. A state minimum wage policy that raises the federal minimum from $7.25 to at least $10 an hour. Again, that's the floor of what the research says is needed in order to be impactful on um, prenatal to three policy outcomes and a refundable state earned income tax credit. That's at least 10% of the federal credit. Again, that's the floor. That's what the research says is needed in order to see these impacts. And so those are the five effective policies. And in addition, we identify these six effective strategies. And the difference between a policy and a strategy is that both are effective. The research says that both of them work. Causal studies demonstrate that they impact our prenatal three outcomes. 
Our strategies are often more targeted in what they're trying to do. And the research is not clear as to exactly how states are supposed to implement these strategies in order to get the um, impacts that we see in the literature. So whereas the research is clear that you need at least a $10 minimum wage to see the impacts that the um, literature finds, for um, things like early head start or home visiting, it's not exactly clear as to how much the state should fund or how the state should fund it in order to get the impacts that we see in the program evaluations. So that's the only distinction, um, but both are important and jointly create this system of care that have these broad-based economic and family supports and more targeted interventions. And for our strategies, we identified these comprehensive screening and referral programs, such as Family Connects or Healthy Steps that offers its services to everyone that is kind of available in that area. And I, does a comprehensive screening of the families to identify what the family needs and offers that instead of offering what it is that we have. We know that childcare subsidies are an essential part of the system of support for families in order to allow them to work and to access care in a much more affordable way. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about childcare subsidies and obviously they're on everyone's um, you know, kind of mind right now as such a big part of the Build Back Better Act that has been proposed. Group prenatal care is another effective strategy. Our evidence-based home visiting programs, especially those focused on parenting, our early head start programs and early intervention. In Texas, we call it early childhood intervention or part C. So I wanted to just start by showing you kind of how these policies vary across the states. Um, currently, there are four states that have implemented all five of those effective policies. And then there's variation in terms of the number of policies that states have implemented. And Texas is among seven states that has not yet implemented any of those effective policies. Um, and so this just begins to, to point to this patchwork of benefits and services that children are exposed to based on the state in which they live. But there's been a lot of progress this past year. This has been a devastating year for families. And we really thought that state, state legislators really thought that they were gonna have to slash budgets and cut programs. And instead, there was a lot of movement forward. Um, and five states actually adopted one of our effective policies this past year. Um, and Missouri actually adopted two. And even this level of movement from you know, not having the policy in place and moving into fully adopting one, masks a lot of the work that actually went on in states as well. So although Missouri and Oklahoma were the two states that actually adopted Medicaid this past year, 11 out of the 12 non-expansion states actually considered expanding the program and some very seriously. Even Texas really took up this mantle of considering Medicaid expansion. Um, Minnesota and Texas were two states that considered um, extending their recertification interval for SNAP up to 12 months. Uh, in Minnesota, that was passed. In Texas, it was considered but um, didn't get voted out of committee. With paid family leave, there was a lot of action at the state level of at least six weeks, as it's kind of the minimum that we were looking at. And Massachusetts became the sixth state to fully implement uh, a paid family leave program that's at least six weeks. It, it implemented 12 weeks in January. And um, we, Rhode Island moved from four to six weeks. Connecticut will be implementing its program soon. Colorado passed a ballot initiative for it. Oregon's gonna be implementing its program soon. Um, so there will be 10 states very soon that will offer paid family leave of at least six weeks. And 23 other states considered legislation this past year. So this is uh, an area that is very active at the state level. For state minimum wages, we had three states that went above the $10 threshold for the first time this past year. Um, and we have three additional states that are already scheduled to go above the $10 mark next year. And 11 states are gonna have at least $15 an hour within the next five years. And there was a lot of legislative activity in terms of increasing minimum wage. 
the federal minimum wage hasn't been increased since 2009. And so um, although we hear stories about lots of folks getting paid higher wages, there's still a substantial number of workers who are working for 7.25 an hour. Two more states next year will have at least a 10% of refundable earned income tax credit, Indiana and Washington, and nine other states voted this past year to expand their EITC. Um, Texas does not have a, a, an income tax, so therefore, for you know, most of the time, we've been thinking that states that don't have an income tax will not have an earned income tax credit. Um, but it, Washington state also does not have an income tax, and they have found a way to fund this and to offer it um, as a credit for families. With regard to progress on strategies, there was also a lot of progress that was made. Um, there were two other states now, uh, in addition to Oregon, that will offer Family Connects to all births in the state over uh, building that up over a period of time. Child care subsidies saw expansions in rates and redu reductions in co-payments and increases in um, uh, eligibility levels. Group prenatal care we saw um, substantial investments in group prenatal care by three states, especially by increasing their uh, Medicaid enhanced reimbursement rate. And in our uh, home visiting programs, our early hit start and early intervention services, there were states that were really making progress to try to expand access and eligibility to those programs. For every state, but especially for Texas, for those of you who are interested, within the roadmap, we um, provide a summary of the legislative action that took place over the past year. And in some cases, there were a lot, and in other cases, there wasn't that much. Um, and that's just a snapshot. And for each of these policies and strategies, uh, we also provide a much more in-depth look at, at the um, legislative action if you kind of click on the policy profiles. So I'm gonna just provide a, a bit more information about what's available in the state policy roadmap because there's so much there and uh, we've never have enough time to go through it all um, right now. But some of you might be interested in, in more, um, you know, uh, strategies. Some of you may be interested more in the policies and you're able to kind of explore what you find most interesting. Um, so this is uh, about Medicaid expansion. And to date, 39 states, which includes uh, the District of Columbia, have expanded Medicaid. And um, by expanding Medicaid, that means that now um, kind of every adult who makes under 138% of the federal poverty level is eligible for Medicaid. Um, and we know that Medicaid is a hugely important policy, both for making that folks have access to health insurance, which is so important for healthier outcomes, but also that it reduces um, financial debt related to, to medical care, it increases resources within the household, and it leads to healthier birth outcomes and healthier outcomes for moms and babies in general. Um, this is also a very affordable policy. Uh, it actually pays for itself um, over time, um, and it has huge impacts on families' well-being. But there are 12 states that have still not expanded Medicaid, and Texas is among those. And what that means is that there are a large share of um, adults that will not have access to health insurance, and especially low-income adults. So currently, if, you, if your state has not expanded Medicaid, there's no childless adult who is eligible for Medicaid. And the eligibility limit for parents varies based on um, which state you live in. If you have expanded Medicaid, the, the policy requires that you, uh, the eligibility threshold is set at 138% of the federal poverty level. Connecticut and DC actually extend that to higher rates. But among those 12 states that have not expanded Medicaid, you can see there's wide variation in the income eligibility thresholds. And in fact, Texas has the lowest income eligibility threshold, meaning that the fewest families are actually eligible. Um, at 17% of the federal poverty level, someone would have to make just right at $300 a month. If they made more than that, they would not be eligible for Medicaid. 
And this sort of variation in eligibility leads to variation in access. And you can see that Texas really ranks at the bottom here with regard to the percentage of um, low-income women of childbearing age who do not have health insurance. And again, this is so crucial for folks of childbearing age to have health insurance because it allows you to be healthier before you become pregnant, healthier during your pregnancy, and healthier following your child's birth. And the range of nearly 50% in Texas to fewer than 4% in D.C., is a direct result of state's policy choices. I also just wanted to um, kind of call out SNAP here, or reducing administrative burden policies, because this is actually where Texas did introduce legislation to try to extend that recertification interval to at least 12 months. And we know that this is important, that um, when states have a combination of accommodative policies or policies that reduce the administrative burden, that this will increase the take up rate for families. And again, these are eligible families. They qualify for the benefit, but there are thousands and thousands who do not actually take advantage of this benefit. It's close to $500 a month toward uh, nutrition or toward food. And SNAP is one of the most effective programs that we have to reduce food security. In fact, it really is the most effective program. And um, when states have at least a 12 month recertification interval, when they offer simplified reporting, meaning that the family just has to report a change in income if it's going to affect their eligibility. And when states offer all their services online, that increases the take up among those who are eligible. But right now you can see there's wide variation um, across states in terms of the percent of families with children who are not receiving SNAP who are eligible. Um, so Texas is um, kind of near the bottom and about 20% of our um, folks who are eligible for SNAP, uh, SNAP benefits are not receiving them. And so if we can extend that recertification interval um, that that will go a long way toward helping more families access the benefits that they, um, does, that they are already eligible for. So I'm not going to go into detail about paid family leave or state minimum wage or earned income tax credit. All of that is available um, in the roadmap if you're interested. But I wanted to just uh, spend a minute to talk about some of the strategies that Texas actually is offering all of these strategies in some way. Um, but one of the limitations in our state is that it's so big and there's so much need that it's hard to really make sure that everyone who needs these um, services are receiving them. So our comprehensive screening referral services or connection programs that uh, I mentioned before are um, really important for identifying the needs that families have. And um, that they have been shown to connect families directly with the resources that they are um, kind of identified that that is what they need. Um, and in Family Connects, there's been some evidence to suggest that it will help families to get into the type of, to higher quality childcare, which we know is essential for children's development as well. <laughs> this is just a, an example of the variation in Family Connects programs across the, the United States. So there is a, a limited number of states that offer Family Connects right now, and that number is expanding. But even among the states that do offer it, you can see in Texas, still just a fraction of our children um, who you know, are born each year have access to this program. So um, there is both a, a need to um, kind of implement the program, but to extend its reach as well. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on child care subsidies because this is an area that Texas has made a lot of changes in in this past um, month or so, and um, that they are so important for families' resources, their ability to work, their ability to afford child care. Um, and uh, the, um, the research is really clear that if we do increase our subsidy rates, that that's good for employers. It's good for child care providers and it's good for families. Um, and so 
this chart here is way too much information to, to try to take in. It's just for you to see the variation across the states in um, what the market rate price of childcare is at the 75th percentile. I'm going to go into some details so you can see it more just in a few states um, here in, in near Texas. But the market rate price is um, something that uh, states are required to gather every year to determine, or every couple of years, to determine what providers are charging. It doesn't necessarily take into consideration the true cost of care, what they should be charging in order to pay the teachers the way that they deserve, a wage that they deserve um, to have the class ratio sizes in a way that would be healthy for children's development. But the market rate survey is something that we can compare across states. And the 75th percentile is the target goal that the Fed set to promote greater um, equitable access. The 75th percentile means that if you take all the providers out there and you um, kind of uh, get what the chart, the price that they're charging, you line them up in a line, that 75th percentile would say this rate will allow that family to access 75% of all of the child care that's around. Um, and 25% will be a higher rate. And then after that is set, so we know what the market rate price is, states set their reimbursement rates and their reimbursement rates is the amount that the provider can receive. And um, of that amount, so that is both the um, kind of first blue and the navy represented in this chart here. That's the amount that the provider will get in order to, if they take a child who has a child care subsidy into their um, center or, or their home. And these rates are based on um, uh, infants and center-based care, but there's variation no matter what, if it's home-based or infants or toddlers too. And um, of that rate that providers get, there's a portion that the state contributes directly to the provider. That's the first blue that you see. And then there's a portion that the family is required to pay. That's called the co-payment. And that's that navy blue that you see. That combined is what the provider gets. But there's often this teal bar that you see here. And that's this additional amount that is between what this um, reimbursement is that the state allows a provider to get and what the provider can charge to families that are not subsidized. And so um, most states allow those providers to charge subsidized families that additional fee, that difference between the subsidy rate and the market rate price. And so that maybe and that teal is a family's out-of-pocket child care expenses. That's how much they have to pay each month in order to even get a subsidized slot. Now, not everyone collects the fee, not everyone pays the fee, but that is part of what the state policy allows. In some states like New Mexico, they don't allow providers to charge that extra fee. And so it's providers then have to absorb that loss, um, which may make them less likely to want to take children who have subsidized um, childcare slots. And so that monthly copay, that amount that the um, state requires that the family pay to the provider, you can see that there's wide variation across the states in that amount that it uh, ranges from zero in South Dakota and Utah for a family uh, at 150% of the federal poverty level to nearly a third of a family's income at that um, income level in Hawaii. And in Texas, it's right at 10% uh, is what they're required to pay um, at, at for their income as a, per or a percentage of their income rather. The Build Back Better Act um, is going to if it passes in its current form, would reduce that percentage to 7%. So no family would pay more than 7% uh, of its income in copays. But remember, the copay isn't the only part that the family's paying. They're also paying that additional fee at, uh, often. And so when you take into consideration the whole market price of care and what the state pays and what the family has to pay, you can see that there, again, is wide variation across states. That in South Dakota, the family doesn't pay any for a family at this income level, 150% of the federal poverty level. 
But in Texas, the family is paying 50% of what the total market price is. And you can imagine that that rate might be too high for many families to afford, that they would choose either not to work and use childcare at all, or they would put their children in lower cost and often lower quality care um, if they have to absorb this high of a, an out-of-pocket cost. And what this graph does is demonstrate that I, I, I said that that market price is based on what providers are charging, but what they actually should charge or need to charge in order to cover um, child care workers at a reasonable wage and um, to really provide a, a, a quality environment is much higher. And this shows what the current subsidy rates are as a portion of the base quality care, the kind of true cost of care. And you can see that in Texas, although there's been a change because the rates did just go up, um, but it, 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 before October 1st, it was covering only about 56% of that true quality of care, or true, true cost of care rather. Um, some states, it's kind of the subsidy rates and the true cost of care are very similar. And in others, there's just a huge difference. So it's something important to take into consideration when we're thinking about our, our reimbursement rates. Um, so I'm gonna um, kind of go through uh, this very quickly, just in the interest of time to make sure that I leave time for questions. But I just wanted to, uh, again, demonstrate that we have these effective programs in place but the take up of them can be very small. We have such a high level of need in our state. It's so big, it's hard to build the infrastructure to provide all of this. Um, the group prenatal care were one of nine states that offers an enhanced reimbursement to families or to uh, physicians rather who provide group prenatal care for um, uh, up to eight to 12 moms during the prenatal period. Uh, but we have a very small proportion who use this currently but there was legislation this past session to really try to enhance um, the use of this program. Um, so you can see where we stand in Texas here relative to other states that are implementing the centering pregnancy model. Our evidence-based home visiting programs were the second largest home visiting program in the um, United States because the federal funding comes uh, as a proportion of, of the number of children that you have in the state who have need. Um, and Texas actually does a lot to fund its home visiting programs um, with state dollars. Still though, even it's such a widespread and um, you know, well-funded program relative to many others, we still serve just around 2% of all the children who would be eligible as compared to some states that are serving um, nearly a quarter or a third of all of their children. Our early head start, um, this is one of the most effective programs that exist in order to really lead to better outcomes for children, uh, for infants and toddlers. And um, we are serving fewer than 5% of eligible children in early head start. And finally, in our early intervention services, these are programs that um, are serving children with either who are at risk of or who have been identified as having a developmental delay and provide a range of services from, to them and their parents. Um, and it has important outcomes for children's development. And if we can kind of identify these problems early, we can really get them onto a healthier track. It reduces the need for special education services later and leads to healthier outcomes over the long haul. Um, however, the variation across states and the percentage of children under age three who receive these services um, is quite vast. And in Texas, it's just around 5% of all of our children who receive EI services. All right, what I wanna do now is uh, to finish, is I wanna show you how state policy choices interact to actually provide resources for households. And I wanna demonstrate this um, for a stylized family. So for this family, we're going to assume that it's a mother with an infant and a toddler, and she works full time at the state's minimum wage. And she leaves her children in center-based care that the price of that care is the 75th percentile. 
So that's just so that we can compare everyone across all the states and see how families are thriving and what are the level of resources that families have available to them based on these states' policy choices. And I'm going to show the variation across Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. And so I'm going to start with the minimum wage. And the same mom would make um, substantially more in Arkansas than Louisiana and Texas because Arkansas has an $11 an hour um, minimum wage versus uh, Louisiana and Texas that has the federal minimum. But she has to work, and so she has to pay out-of-pocket child care costs. In both Arkansas and Louisiana, at this income level, there are no out-of-pocket child care costs. There's no copayment. There's no fee. And in Texas, there is a copayment and there is a fee. And so that $7.25 an hour is reduced um, to, to cover those out-of-pocket uh, child care expenses. And then if we add in the nutritional benefits that the mom is eligible for, mom and children are eligible for, and um, the state's tax credits that, and the federal tax credits that she's eligible for, you can see that there's a substantial increase in the resources, both um, in nutrition and tax credits. And on a temporary basis, while the American Rescue Plan Act is still in uh, effect for another year, that, um, or for, for this year, rather, if it's renewed um, through Build Back Better, it would be for at least one more year. You can see that those expenses are even larger. And in Texas, they find, finally almost catch up to Louisiana there because of that child and dependent care tax credit um, that allows her to offset some of those out-of-pocket expenses. So that's how these kind of combine together to um, provide resources for families. In Louisiana, she has access to Medicaid because that state has expanded the program too. Now, Texas, um, this is a, a huge story and um, something that Texas should be very proud of. As of October 1st, it increased its base reimbursement rate. So what I showed you before was what, um, what was in effect as of August 1st, what went into the roadmap. But at effective October 1st, it has changed its rates. And um, rather than being at the 30th percentile of its most recent uh, market rate survey, it increased it to the 60th for infants, the 55th for toddlers, and 50th for uh, preschool and school age kids, uh, which is uh, you know, near doubling of the rates for many. And um, that it's kind of even creating a higher minimum threshold for state um, child care providers that are participating in Texas Star and that are rated at a higher level of quality. Um, and so that has a really big impact. If I were to have shown you the same graphic that I just uh, showed um, before October 1st, then you would see that Texas, the out-of-pocket child care expenses are huge. And it basically cuts a mom's earnings in half just to pay for her child to have child care. But by increasing those reimbursement rates, it reduces that fee, that, that difference between what the um, market rate price is and what the provider gets. And so that really reduces a mom's out-of-pocket child care expenses quite a bit and allows her to maintain those earnings. Um, and um, although she's not getting as much now in her uh, child and dependent care tax credit, um, at the end of the day, the green line, which is the permanent resources that she has, is uh, larger now than it was oct uh, before October 1st. So this change in uh, child care reimbursement rates has made a big difference for families. Um, and then also, if you look at the total available resources, this is for all 51 states, you can see this huge variation in North Carolina, um, the same family has fewer than $22,000 in resources to cover everything, including housing and food and transportation. Um, whereas that same family in DC has over 42,000. And you can see that in Texas, that this childcare reimbursement moved the mom um, from the, where she was as of August 1st, up quite a bit now to having substantially more resources to provide for her um, infant and to infant and toddler. All right, so I'm gonna kind of close out here just by offering us as a resource for anyone that 
would be interested in learning more about these um, policies and kind of the evidence about them, how they're being implemented in various states, the generosity and, and what that means for children's well-being or how states might kind of make changes that would increase the generosity and benefits that families have access to. And I encourage you to, to reach out to us and contact us. Um, I actually am going to be leaving the University of Texas and moving to Vanderbilt, um, and my team is uh, coming with me, and so we're excited to move the pre three Policy Impact Center there, but you can still get a hold of us um, through our website, and um, we are always going to be a resource here for Texas, so um, anyway, thank you so much for listening to this. I'm going to stop sharing, and so I can take any questions that folks have. Um, let's see. I see that there are um, uh, some questions that have been included, and so I really appreciate them. So someone asked whether administrative burden is an issue for other benefits besides SNAP, and the answer to that is yes. It applies to nearly every one of the policies on our roadmap, but to policies in general. And we chose SNAP, one, because the, the, the nutrition benefit is so crucial for families. And it's a good example of a federal program. The, the federal government sets the benefit levels. Um, it sets the eligibility levels. That's not something that states have any control over. What they do have control over is whether families actually can have access to those benefits. And so, by making their policies more accommodative and less uh, burdensome, they can really increase that, um, those who are eligible and, and who are using it. But this applies to Medicaid, it applies to take-up rates for any of those programs that um, I was showing of group prenatal care and home visiting and so forth. And it takes an intentional effort on the part of states to want to provide services to those who are eligible in order to to look at your policies and see how you can think from a user's perspective, a family's perspective, and what would ease their access. It saves states money um, in terms of, uh, the, you know, it's costly to have to have someone come in and recertify every six months or three months or whatever it might be. And it also saves the family time and money so they don't have to take time off of work, take a couple of buses in order to go and, uh, recertify for something in which their income or, or hasn't changed at all. Um, so states have a responsibility to set um, some parameters around eligibility and making sure that we reduce fraud, but we know that there are additional uh, burdens that are put in place that really reduce the use among those who are eligible. Um, so there's another question about what local organizations or individuals can do to support these effective policies and strategies. And that's such a great question. We're looking at state policy choices only because that is um, a, a way for us to compare across the country and of all the different efforts that are going on in this kind of patchwork of benefits. But within a, a state, there's also a lot of variation and, um, and Texas is a great example of communities that have really stepped in to provide their own sorts of approaches to serving families. So in uh, Fort Worth and Tarrant County, there is a, a huge effort to focus on the prenatal to three period using Help Me Grow and other sorts of evidence-based programs to try to service families from the prenatal period all the way up until they start school. The Child Poverty Action Lab in Dallas County has been doing this amazing work to um, can meet families where they are and use evidence to try and, and increase the resources that families have access to. Here in Austin, the Success by Six program, again, has been thinking holistically and bringing not just the child care providers, but other uh, human services and health together to the table to really try to think about a system of care in Harris County and in Houston. They also have new initiatives that they're doing to, to try to support families directly. San Antonio has huge, an, a huge initiative through the United Way there. I could go on. 
it's really the implementation all happens at the community level. And in a lot of cases, when the state government isn't necessarily stepping in, the um, communities themselves are raising money and, and providing services. Um, so there is a question about whether I could provide more insight as to how the Build Back Better Act, uh, which is hard to say, would potentially affect these policies in Texas. So the first would be in the child uh, care subsidies. That would be um, the, the, the part of the act that has been, if anything has been stable on there, the most stable in that um, we, it is going to provide child care, enough money for states to make it so that the child care subsidy amount to providers would try to cover the kind of true cost of care, paying our child care workers a wage that um, they deserve for the immensely hard job that they do, that would allow the providers to um, set their ratios between the number of adults to children at levels that are healthy, that would have higher standards um, for quality. And so the, the reimbursement rates would be larger and the family's um, responsibility for what they would owe would not exceed 7% of their income up to um, very high levels of income. And there would be no additional fees. Um, so there's no difference in what the providers are getting in their market rate price anymore. Um, so it will have a huge impact for many families on really reducing those out-of-pocket child care expenses. Um, there is also currently a provision that may or may not stay in. I, I don't know um, if it's in even this hour, but uh, four weeks of paid family leave um, in Texas uh, it does not have any paid leave. Currently, families are only eligible for the Family Medical Leave Act um, which is unpaid leave and not all uh, employees are eligible for that. So this would really expand access to paid leave for families. Um, the Medicaid provisions would be expanded if, if that stays in the bill, um, that it would provide Medicaid um, for the states that have not expanded, expanded Medicaid yet. This would allow them to, to uh, families to access it um, it would extend postpartum coverage. So I could probably have a whole hour just talking about uh, the benefits that it will have. But again, I'm not exactly sure what's going to pass. So I would um, call your representatives to um, tell them what you want in that bill. <laughs> um, so there's another question about um, seen in my research that points to successful strategies on how states can pay for expansion of benefits for policies. So this is a really good question um, because it, it really spotlights the variation in how this is done. I'm going to use paid family leave just as one example, but again, it's been implemented. Um, it's been enacted in, in uh, 10 states, implemented in six. And across the board, there is wide variation in um, kind of how it's funded and the uh, department that it's funded through, you know, that's administered through. Some states, it is a combination of employers and employees. Others, it's all on the employee. Others, uh, it's all on the employer. And so, you know, some have uh, just increased their unemployment insurance tax or the disability tax. Others are going to tax it in a different sort of way. Um, so there's such wide variation in how states are doing this. What we, um, we just did a seminar a couple of weeks ago now on how states are effectively using Medicaid to fund a lot of these effective strategies. Um, that Medicaid is a matched program between the federal government and the states. And so when it can use Medicaid, it's, it, it's, the state doesn't have to pay the full cost of it. Um, obviously, that doesn't affect uh, families who are not on Medicaid, but it can be a really important way of increasing access to services, especially to things like um, early intervention or group prenatal care. Um, many states are using it to fund home visiting programs or comprehensive screening and uh, connection programs. Um, there are other states that are tapping into some of their uh, kind of reserve funds. There are states that have New Mexico is um, going to kind of 
create an early childhood fund that it will um, kind of always have this dedicated uh, funding stream for early childhood. So I could, I could probably go on and on about the, the wide variation. We haven't necessarily studied you know, whether one way of funding something works better than another way. Um, and that probably does vary state to state. But we are trying to learn about that variation so that states have different examples to use as they are trying to set up whatever funding structure that they need. Um, obviously, for policymakers, they want to know how much does it cost and how we pay for it. And the return on the investment on a lot of these uh, strategies and, and policies is, is positive, meaning that when you implement it, it ends up saving money through cost avoidance or increasing tax revenues and so forth. Um, but there is usually initial investments and um, that is a, an important question that uh, legislators need answered. Um, so I'm not seeing any additional questions um, right now. And I, I know that we're right at time. And I just wanted to make sure to, to thank you all for uh, coming here, that that has been, you know, glad, always glad to be able to share what we're doing and to invite you to the next um, UT Early Childhood Scholars Series event that will, uh, in which UT Health in San Antonio is going to present on December 9th about addressing the effects of substance use on women and children and looking at from a community driven perspective. So I'm really excited um, to see that event coming up in a month. And um, I wish you all a great weekend and a very, very happy Thanksgiving. I hope everyone gets a chance to relax and spend time with your loved ones and be thankful for all the blessings that we actually have now coming out of this incredibly, incredibly year and a half. So thank you again for joining me today.